Hello and welcome to the World Soccer Talk podcast, your weekly dose of talking about watching soccer on TV, online and apps. Coming up on episode 40, we discuss strong viewing numbers for the Premier League on NBC Sports so far this season, the staggering number of soccer games on TV and streaming this weekend, feedback on Turner's plans for the Champions League, as well as Univision making inroads on La Liga in the United States. That plus much, much more. And of course, we've got your listener mailbag with uh, questions and comments from you, the listeners. My name is Christopher Harris, a.k.a. The Gaffer, and I'm joined today by Kartik Krishnaya. Kartik, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Excellent. Well, we had the special uh, bonus podcast last week with the, uh, the news about Turner, and we'll get more into that a little bit later in terms of some, some of the feedback from you, the listeners. But for those listeners who haven't had a chance to dive into the show much in the past, uh, instead of uh, analyzing every single big talking point, transfer story, uh, match itself, what we do is focus in on the experience of watching soccer and television, talking about the commentators, the TV production, uh, everything including the streaming options that are out there, uh, as well as all of the latest news that are going to affect you, the listener, in terms of your soccer watching experience, no matter what league you watch. Uh, it's primarily for the United States, but uh, we do dive into topics from around the world too. So if you do have any feedback or questions, let us know. We're here to answer, answer you guys and uh, give you guys some, some feedback. So Kartik, let's start off by talking about uh, what you've been watching this past week. Yeah, it's uh, obviously been uh, an interesting week with uh, all the transfer discussions, the start of the Bundesliga season, everything going on. So we'll dive right into it. Uh, Friday, kickoff of the Bundesliga season, you had uh, Bayern hosting Bayer Leverkusen, a club you and I are very familiar with, a club that we visited uh, a year and a half ago, uh, or well, close to two years ago at the beginning of the uh 2015-2016 season and uh, this was a disappointing game for the first uh, 20 minutes or so then Leverkusen down 2-0 really began to start playing and maybe we're unlucky that they only lost 3-1 they were the better team for much of the game after they fell down 2-0 uh, good job by Ross Dyer who I'll get to a little more about Ross Dyer in a few minutes Ross Dyer and Stu Holden calling this game I thought the Fox studio of, uh, of Kate Abdo, Ian Joy and Eric Winalda was outstanding to start the season uh, brought us into the season really well. And then great call by uh, Ross Dyer and Stu Holden on this match. Uh, Stu Holden, I think, is more comfortable in two-man booths. But this conversation we're going to continue to have for nine months, right, yeah. going into the World Cup. But I, I thought they were very, very solid in this game. Uh, at the same time, I was watching Burton uh, and, and Birmingham um, with John Champion. Uh, Nigel Clough's side is, uh, and now they've won, I think, in the League Cup also this this week. Uh, they're, uh, they're punching well above their their weight in uh in championship football and uh it was uh fairly improbable they stayed in the division last season and uh looks like they're well on their way to staying up again this season so that that was an enjoyable game um now the next morning uh, and unfortunately chris um <laughs> you, you probably missed the uh missed the commentary you were watching it at a pub but uh, uh peter drury had to go solo for a while um in this match, uh, and that was probably the best part of the match for, for from your perspective. <laughs> I, uh, well, I was I, I was watching at a pub, but I, I still could hear the the commentary in the background. And about eighteen minutes in, I'm like, wait a second, like someone just joined Peter Drury, and I, I, I guess I didn't realize because uh, when you're in the pub, it's was it eighteen experience. minutes? I didn't time it, but yeah, it was, yeah eighteighteen it was like minutes, and it was uh, Ke uh, Kevin Coban. I guess he was stuck in traffic. Uh, or whatever happened, maybe on on the M4, I'm not sure. But that was that was pretty funny. And actually, I checked Kevin's uh, Twitter uh, account later that day to see if he posted anything there, but he didn't say anything. So he's probably hoping that everyone forgets about it. But um, it's happened before. I can't remember. It has happened before uh, in other games I've watched where the commentator comes in late. Um, Does it happen more often in Swansea games or in games in the Northeast? Because I'm just thinking remote parts of the country, maybe. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. It might have been abroad someplace, but uh, it has happened before. And actually, oh gosh, there's probably some, the listeners probably can remember some good examples of ones that are kind of uh, high profile ones that have happened where the commentators didn't show up or they were stuck in traffic. I know in the World Cup in Brazil, there were problems in terms of uh, trying to get all, everyone there to the stadiums in time, especially with all the yeah. flooding. I think the ESPN made it okay. But uh, but it was it was interesting. And, and actually, I think uh, Peter Drury and Kevin Caban kind of, 
I think they joked about it for, for a minute or two. Uh, but I, I, in some ways, uh, Peter did, did a great job by himself for the first 18 minutes. Yeah, yeah, I thought he did very well, and unfortunately, the game wasn't so good. Uh, Swansea, they made a move this week getting Sam Klukas. That should help. Yeah. A good left-footed midfielder, and and uh, they need some help. That's uh, pretty obvious. Uh, Wolfsburg Dortmund was um, uh, on uh, on Fox right after that uh, on FS1, and that was Ian Joy doing the match, uh, calling the match this time. Johan Karofsky, Johan Karofsky took his place in the studio alongside Eric Winalda and Kate Abdo, and it seemed pretty seamless. Karofsky, who was um, I would say poor, average to poor most of last season was much better of in, in this uh, in, in this cameo that he made. Uh, the game was well called by uh, uh, Ian Joy. This game was not competitive. Dortmund uh, uh, blew them out of the water. Christian put Pulisic, the American, having uh, scoring the first goal of the Bundesliga season for, for Borussia Dortmund, who are without Dembele. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know what's going to happen there, but as of now, as of this recording, Dembele is still on Dortmund's books, and they're holding out for... Uh, and why not? I mean, Barcelona's desperate. Why not hold out there? Um, interesting discussion after the match. Uh, Eric Winalda thinks Mainz, who have been a solid mid-table slash top top half of the table club the last several years under uh first under tom thomas tuchel and then the last few seasons since tuchel moved to dortmund uh could be in serious relegation trouble this season um then they they had schalke red bull uh sorry, schalke rbl <laughs> rb leipzig i i do that subconsciously by the way i don't do that on purpose uh derek ray was calling the game so very good call uh this match wasn't so good and schalke got a victory which uh gets their season off started well i mean i think we all know that Leipzig's going to have a hard time. They're going to have a, it's going to be a tough act to follow this season for them. So, um, hey, Kartik, on, on the Bundesliga, before you move on to any of the other leagues or any other matches you watched, um, it, it's, it's tough because I, I watched the Bayern uh, Leverkusen game on the Friday. And, and yes, the, the studio team was fantastic. I thought Ian Joy is really kind of uh, in his element, especially with, next to Ronaldo. I mean, they, they know that league inside and out. And, and you can tell Kate Abdo uh, being a German speaker and also following the league very closely great uh, great find there so studio is fine commentary is fine you got Stu Holden my, my issue Kartik is just the just the level of competition we go right back yeah. to where we were with the Bundesliga in the past before the first game and I'm watching this game and I'm like I'm like by halftime I'm just it's over I mean, it it's looks something like the league's got to address because I mean Bayern this is this is the problem Bayern is it feels like they've fallen behind Real Madrid and Barcelona they're probably not behind Barcelona anymore but they felt like they feel like they were neck and neck with those two giants uh, a few years ago and they've fallen behind and so they're making in some cases vanity purchases I think Hamas is a vanity purchase uh, a marketing purpose purchase but it's it's pushing them even further afield from uh, from the rest of the, 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 the Bundesliga I mean last season Leipzig ran them close for um, a little bit over half the season, there was a stretch of games where Bayern kept getting results with with stoppage time equalizers or winners, mm-hmm. and that's when they pulled away from from Leipzig. But Leipzig was within th- three to five points until that point in the season. And then the previous season, obviously Thomas Tuchel's Dortmund team had a, a record for BVB points haul, uh, more than the years they won the championship, the back to back years under Jurgen Klopp, or pr- previously had won the championship under uh, Otmar Hitzfeld in the 1990s, and um, Yet they still finish like 10 points back or eight points back, something like that. So, yeah, yeah the, the, the competitiveness at the top of the league, I would argue the league is much better. Not Maybe not much better, and we'll see what happens this season. I would argue last season the league was better at the bottom than the Premier League. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I you take uh, Bournemouth, who finished ninth in the Premier League, and I think they might have been relegated in, in Germany. And, and Southampton was a very poor eighth. They finished with 46 points. Uh, but this season, I think the Premier League has made the kinds of buys from outside the league, uh, from the continent, that will improve the rest of the league. And if the rest of the Bundesliga doesn't improve, um, then I think there's going to be a little interest in the league. We'll get we'll get to the TV ratings in yeah. a little bit. The well, ratings were marginally better, but it's still. I mean, when you start at such a, 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 a low basement, it's easy to improve ratings, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and and that's the thing, Kartik, is that the numbers were up. Uh, we'll get more into that in a little bit. But it's just it's one. Of the, it's like kind of the same old story. And, and unfortunately, I mean, you look at the Premier League. You look at look at the opening game of the week, uh, the the season. 
Arsenal against Leicester, kind of a back and forth. Yeah, a lot of defensive mistakes, but you mean a 4-3. The next game is Watford against Leicester. I mean, Le- Leicester, um, I'm sorry, Watford against Liverpool. And you mean Watford uh, came back. And, and just in the Bundesliga, just the Bayern so far ahead. It just, in terms of the the viewing experience, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make me want to keep on coming and I back. I think to entertainment it. is a is is a big factor. Look, uh, Dortmund may have been the most entertaining team in Europe late Klopp years, early Tuchel years. But part of the reason was they were playing that, and we're seeing it now with Liverpool, right? They concede a lot of goals. You, Dortmund games last season were ridiculous, and that might have been part of the reason Tuchel got sacked, among other reasons, board, boardroom intrigue, etc. Peter Bosch now comes in from. Ajax and um, I think they're probably going to shore up their back line which is going to make them less entertaining this is again uh, a conversation and we've had it for a couple of years uh, Alexi Lalas and Eric Winalva threw it out the second Fox got the Bundesliga rights would people be moved in this country by quality or by entertainment because they would both argue that the Bundesliga is a, is a a higher quality league in the Premier League. I've argued that too the last few seasons. I'm not sure that'll hold this season, but the viewers respond to entertainment. They want to see goals. They're not necessarily uh, checking out tactical. Um, they're, they're not a tactical geeks like a lot of us or, or, or wanting to see the necessarily the crisp midfield passing uh, that maybe some of us relish. And, and I think the, the passing, the, the, the shape, the tactics tend to be better in the Bundesliga than they are in uh, uh, in the Premier League. Yeah. But that's not what, pe- what people respond to. I mean, I, it's, fun- it's funny because a lot of analysts, Chris, after that Leicester Arsenal game, I mean, you just turned to ESPN FC and you'd see Shaka Hislop and Craig Burley talk about how bad they thought the Premier League was, how what a bad advertisement for the Premier League they thought that game was. But then, mm-hmm. as you're saying, people were moved by because it, it was entertaining. I completely disagree with that, it, especially in terms of Fox's question as far as do you want quality or entertainment? I, I don't want either them i want competitive games i want to watch oh, okay. whether, whether, yeah. whether it's the premier league or, or i mean in this case the bundesliga i want to so watch to you man united scoring three goals i mean again it was against swansea which is which tugs at your heart but scoring three goals like that on on a lightning on lightning quick breaks that's not entertaining to you that's not right. what you want right though yeah it's, it's a, it might be a neat move to watch yeah and and to me it, it, it gets boring i mean so i look at bayern munich when i watch bayern munich play yes they're a fantastic team in the bundesliga and in the champions league but they're boring because they almost always win their games and it's such a, a, a such a, a canter that it's, I mean, the other teams can't keep up. I would much prefer to watch kind of a, a Watford-Liverpool game or an Arsenal-Leicester game in just those examples where it is more com- competitive. It's back and forth. Any of those teams can win. And with the Bundesliga, that that's the thing that, that stops me from watching more of it. Well, there's so much soccer to, to watch. But that's one of the reasons is it, it's not that competitive in that league I mean the Premier League yes you look at Man United running away with it so far but there's a long way to go and it could be any any what six six or seven teams that could win it yeah there's um, seven teams that could win the Premier League this yeah. season in my opinion uh, uh, I sure well look okay I don't think Arsenal's going to win the league so let's say there'll be six teams but um there's six teams that could win the league I'm including Everton in that by the way um but yeah, I mean, by October, we'll think that there are only three teams that can win the league. and uh, that, But we're still having that conversation. Yeah. We're not having the conversation in, um, in, in in Germany. I mean, the only real conversation we're having in Germany, two conversations are, will big teams like Wolfsburg and Hamburg continue to get sucked into relegation battles every season? Yeah. And um, can Borussia Dortmund under Bosch, who's come in from Ajax, of who's a rare non-German manager, by the way, in the in the Bundesliga, can he come in and uh, and bring Dortmund back to um, an elevated level, maybe in European competition? Uh, maybe we're not even talking about challenging for the Bundesliga title. We're just thinking maybe Dortmund, because they qualify for Europe every year, maybe their focus has to be to try and win a Champions League here mm-hmm. at some point, rather than uh, trying to win the Bundesliga, because as crazy as it sounds, it might be easier for Borussia Dortmund to get by Real Madrid or Juventus uh, in a one-off game if they can get that far than mm-hmm. trying to win the Bundesliga. Yeah. As insane as that sounds. Yeah, and in the Bundesliga, it's it's, uh, it's it's the season seems to be over within the first 20 minutes. It's just like they're so far above uh, Leverkusen which is I mean going through some tough times as it is I don't know it, it, we, we can talk about the Bundesliga all day long which I do enjoy the league I do enjoy the the skill level the crowds there's a lot of attractive things to it it's just that when I watch Bayern Munich I, I just get bored 
um, just because they're so much better than the other teams. But and, 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 I, and, I, and I have a friend who listens to this podcast who I know is listening right now who, who turned the game off after the 20 minutes and just watched the Burton Birmingham game. I had it on my computer at the same time, but basically said, yeah, the season was over. Uh, he'd watch the championship because it was more competitive, and, and I totally get that. So um, anyway, moving on, um, uh, watched uh, obviously uh, uh, the, the second half after uh, the – Schalke Red Bull game didn't uh, Schalke RBL game didn't necessarily uh, do the trick for me. I switched to the Stoke Arsenal game, which was um, which was interesting. I mean, I I, um, I I tended to think that Hesse might have a hard time settling in the Premier League. That was a a bad decision. <laughs> a bad uh, statement by me uh, internally with some of my friends. And he, he, he looked a, a, a terror in that first first match. Um, he's a player I liked at Real Madrid, was surprised. Yep. He never quite uh, cut the mustard there. I don't know what happened at PSG that they've now sold him or loaned him to Stoke. But uh, PSG is a different kettle of fish, right? They're, I don't know what um, necessarily what they're looking for in a striker. But he looked very good in that game. I thought NBC's coverage was good. But um, again, I, and, and we're going to get to this in a minute with, with Hercules Gomez coming on the ESPN FC show and, and their thing. There seems to be um, a difference in how Arsenal is viewed on NBC versus ESPN, and we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, Huddersfield, Newcastle, John Champion was outstanding. It was a great game to watch uh, for me because I, li- I like watching Huddersfield. Uh, I like David Wagner and, and uh, Aaron Moy uh, had a had a cracker of a goal a very very uh fine performance from him and uh the the real question one of the big questions in english football right now is what's going to happen to newcastle united what's going to happen to rafa benitez Uh, how is this club ever under mike ashley going to be competitive Uh, obviously i think everybody thinks the best thing would be if he if the the rumors are correct and he sells the team at some point soon uh that would be the best thing but until then that will be a consistent talking point and i feel like that was um the crew's talking point throughout much of this game um then Kartik, and, yeah. and also uh, newcastle lost in the uh, league cup last night yes. against nottingham yes. forest so that's that's right. three games that they've uh, they've lost yeah, and, and uh, there is um, there are some theories out there that Benitez has money to spend but doesn't want to spend it. I, I, I don't necessarily believe that. I, I think that there is obviously something uh, going on with Mike Ashley. We saw his comments a week ago about how he's not a shake and he doesn't have that kind of money and all, all of uh, this sort of thing. So, um, look, if, if Rafa walks mm-hmm. – uh, it's going to be very hard for Mike Ashley to get the fans back on side. I think he's, he, and he knows that, which is why he hasn't made the move yet. He hasn't sacked him or forced him out, but uh, things are going to come to a head pretty quickly. Uh, Spurs, Chelsea. Um, I, I thought that um, Arlo White and Lee Dixon had a, had a good game, but let me uh, address a concern you've had in the past. I, I went ahead and timed this. We had a minute and 13 seconds of pregame from the time Rebecca Lowe threw it over to Arlo White. Now it's different when it's an NBS, NBCSN Sunday game than the Saturday games that uh, start abruptly on NBC mm-hmm. at uh, yep. 1230 on the, on the wa- uh, 1230 and zero seconds on the watch uh, Saturday Eastern time. So uh, about a minute and 13 of pregame, Arlo White talked through that pregame. Uh, 21 seconds into the match, he introduced Lee Dixon and said, he's my partner, blah, 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 but then continued talking. And re- Dixon really didn't say anything until a minute 16 into the match. And then from that point, it was it was flowing pretty well. Uh, Dixon, as usual, made some very, very good points. And I, and I thought uh, Arlo White had a good game, but that just speaks to your your concern about the way he, he cues up broadcasts. I mean, he, uh, <laughs> he, he could do a solo broadcast. He might have been more equipped than Peter Drury to, uh, to deal with that situation <laughs> in, in Swansea. Yeah, and he's probably done that in the past, I would think, to uh, either for BBC Radio that he's done, or, or some of the, maybe some of the Seattle games, or I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, well, there was a game that he did, um, a U.S. Open Cup game between Seattle and the LA Galaxy, uh, classic game in 2011, I think it was, mm-hmm. where his solo call was kind of a thing that is etched in people's minds, at least in, in minds of MLS fans, uh, as this just great call, epic call of a, of a, of a big game between 
you know, maybe the two biggest teams in the league in, in a cup, um, cup semifinal, cup final, cup semifinal. Can't remember exactly, but he, he's done it. I mean, at least stateside, he, he's revered for it. But um, you might be talking to a different audience when you're talking about the Premier League. I don't know mm-hmm. that MLS and MLS. He was very popular for it. Yeah, it's, it's a very American style, and uh, it's not even just American, very American. It's just very conversational, uh, which is okay at times if it's a really boring match and there's nothing much going on and you're trying to kill some time. Uh, but when it's you know, Spurs, Chelsea, and uh, or in previous examples in the previous weeks or previous years, you don't have to talk that much. I mean, it's uh, yes, you give the kind of the op- opening, but the opening doesn't have to be that long. Spurs, Chelsea speaks for itself, right? The top two clubs in the league last season, uh, Wembley. There's not. There's. 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 Um, in, in, I think you're dealing with an educated uh, fan base now. This. This might be the situation where, uh, again, we criticize Major League Soccer. We're going to get into it in our feature topic of the week for for trying to win over casuals. Is Arlo White trying to win over casuals or American soccer, uh, American sports fans who might happen to turn on NBCSN or, or NBC over the air in painting a picture of a match and giving facts and details that um, educated Premier League fans already know? It, could that be it? Well, it's, that's a great question, Kotick. We, we'd have to go back to the tapes of him for the Seattle Sounders and doing MLS games and, and finding, out, finding out if he did the same thing back then that he does today. Um, I mean, again, we're in the fifth season of NBC's broadcast, so we've had four years of Ola White given kind of the, I mean, the minute to two minute kind of op- openings uh, and overlooking some of the things happening during matches. So that hasn't changed i think i think in many ways that works well for new listeners or new viewers uh to the premier league but um i don't know i we would have to go back to the tapes and see if if that's something that just inherently that's his style or if he's going kind of been instructed to do that so nbc had a had an interesting weekend i think uh, match of the day two uh was was aired Sunday night and was really, really good. Um, Kyle Martino and uh, Robbie Musto were on the couch and, and uh, uh, Martino made a great point about how impressed he was by how quickly Chelsea picks up new ideas and how Conte can make a tactical tweak or two even within an established formation. And it works. He can do it on the training ground uh, midweek and Saturday, Sunday. They're ready to play in that formation. Um, and uh, there was some good additional analysis from Robbie Musto on the physicality of the match and how Spurs at times were not able to match that level of physicality despite having a guy like Wanyama in central midfield who was so good last season and uh, seemed to get bossed at times in this game although uh, look the analysis is based on the result i mean i think spurs were the better team but that's been the case look i've said this um people who who follow me know that i've been saying for three years spurs are the best team in the league and yet they never they never win anything so they're the best team a lot and there are a lot of games where i've watched where they've been the best team and they've not won or they've not gotten three points or uh over the course of pochettino's tenure so it's a little bit frustrating and again they would not be in the position they're in without this manager but it seems like in big matches, there's something, it's just something that doesn't happen for them. Um, but that's a, that's a conversation for another day. Um, ESPN FC, that same night, same time as uh, match of the day, too, actually, uh, was a rare combination of Adrian Healy, Steve Nichol, and Brian McBride. Uh, no Craig Burley, no Shaka Hislop, uh, no Ali Moreno. Uh, Healy did well uh, as a host, I thought. And when it, you know, he's. I think our biggest complaint about Adrian Healy is that he's very um, defensive of U.S. soccer and Major League Soccer. When the topic areas are not Major League Soccer or U.S. soccer, he's pretty good. And he was very good on um, on uh, this show. Uh, Hercules game, Gomez came on after the first uh, segment where uh, McBride and Nickel dissected all the Premier League matches except for one. Um, Gomez came on to discuss La Liga, Bundesliga, and then Arsenal, um, MLS and Liga MX. Uh, they couldn't. They couldn't have the Arsenal discussion without Hercules Gomez. Everybody wants a part of that. Uh, again, I think I said this the previous week. I think the producers at this show. Uh, this might be a, a great question for our friend Steve Police. They they relish when Arsenal loses. I mean, it's like all their commentators. Everybody's chomping at the bit to discuss it, mm-hmm. and they give some very good analysis. But again, it's it's a very different approach towards Arsenal than NBC has. Um, 
I really like this this particular show because I think it showed ESPN's versatility when they don't have uh, the big guns. You know, Burley and Hislop, I think we would consider the two real big guns from that show in terms of heavyweight analysis. But they had uh, they were able to do a very good show without either of those two guys. Um, ESPN. I, 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 I think, Carter, I, mean, I mean, one of the differences that, that comes to my mind is that ESPN FC is probably more going to go for hot takes or hot opinions. Versus, right. say, NBC, that's going to be more of kind of level-headed analysis. And yes, they can be critical. And yes, they can be uh, pro-Arsenal in certain ways. But maybe that's the difference in terms of just almost like a, di- a different type of style uh, from both of them, which is kind of why they're kind of differing in styles in terms of their analysis of Arsenal. Yeah, it's also how the co- hosts drive uh, the show. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, this was Healy, who was a little more, a uh, uh, little more indulgent of, of the uh, co- uh, commentators on on, uh, on the set. But Dan Thomas and and Seb Salazar are very provocative with the questions they ask, uh, in in a manner that um, I think brings out that a little bit of that hot take, uh, which which I enjoy. Um, and then actually Monday, I'll get I'll get to Monday in a minute. Um, the Man City Everton game on uh, Monday, Liam McHugh was hosting uh, for NBC. No drop off from Rebecca Lowe. He had a, a, another good performance. He's a pro. Uh, he brought in uh, Martin Tyler, and I thought it was uh, Martin Tyler and Danny Higginbotham, and it was interesting. Martin Tyler made the uh, Eclipse uh, reference uh, on air live for the U.S. audience right as the Eclipse was going on. So I thought that was really neat because I had actually my glasses on and was ready to run outside. Was that Martin Tyler did? Was that pre-match? I, that was pre-match. I, I missed the yeah. I missed the pre-match. Yeah, oh, it was interesting. At, it was about two ten, and uh, McHugh brought them both live from the set, uh, from the game as they do on Mondays. Right. And he made that reference. Um, uh, McHugh then had uh, Bauer on. And we haven't seen Steve Bauer all yeah. season, so that was. Um, a sight for sore eyes for me and Bauer was very good. They spent about 10 minutes discussing various issues, particularly Coutinho and uh, the situation at Liverpool with Coutinho. So that was excellent. Um, it, it was a, it was a good game. Um, Gordiola and Kuhn know each other about as well as two people in football can respect each other as much as two people in football can. So Everton, uh, Man City matches are always cagey, uh, Transitioning to ESPN FC. Wait, 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 wait I have to ask you. So I, I missed the the pre match, and I, and I think I, I caught the game right as it, it was getting ready to start because I was I don't know walking my dog or, or, or something. I can't remember what I was doing. What about the the Tunnel Club? So how did that look on television? And what are your thoughts about that? And, and for listeners who don't know, Manchester City has uh, re- redesigned their uh, tun- players' tunnel where it has uh, see through glass, and they've um, sold seats or subscriptions to, to yeah, fans? Yeah, I, I thought it looked pretty tacky, personally, but that's um, with, with all these kind of fans uh, gulping beers, uh, watching the players come out. It was, was pretty, I thought it was pretty odd, but maybe it's something we'll get used to as the season goes on. Apparently, it's pretty common in American sports. In fact, I'm not surprised by that. I think this, thing, this sort of thing's been going on for years in American sports, and what we're finding with Manchester City in particular is because of financial fair play they, they're finding they're trying all kinds of ways to monetize things mm-hmm. without raising ticket prices on um their average fans because manchester city still has one of the lowest uh average ticket prices for game per game in the in the premier league at least among bigger clubs and they still have a working class supporter space they're not they're not um, going to do what Arsenal has done in terms of ticket prices or che- what, what Chelsea is going to do with the new stadium or, or Tottenham. So I think they're looking for ways to, to, to generate additional revenue from their supporters, including this official supporters group now that they've been soliciting me to join, actually, uh, th- that uh, is a, an official club sponsored supporters group, which to me is really bizarre hmm. but um they've been soliciting me since uh, my birthday three weeks ago sending me uh first the supporters club wished me happy birthday and then they've been asking me to join for 40 pounds or, or something like that uh, a year and, and get all this and uh, all this access um so they're looking for other ways to generate revenue i get it i'm not necessarily a fan of it but i, I totally get it it looked tacky um so this um, this was interesting. Ian, Ian Dark was on ESPN FC, hosted by Ross Dyer, which was cool to see just a few days after he called the Bundesliga game on Fox. And Ian Dark said, uh, and I keep saying, and you know, Chris, you know this. I tweet every time at the start of every season. Man City starts minus six points because they have to play Everton twice. Or um, uh, this is yep. their bogey team. Don't don't read too much into anything that happens today. Ian Dark said he, you know, we turn up at the stadium every time Manchester City plays Everton and we say hey it's just history and then every time they play 
Everton either beats them or draws them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's it's, it is instructive. Historical vogue teams are instructive, and Manchester City has, other than when Everton was being managed by Roberto Martinez, has had a horrible time. No matter how big the gap is in wages, and the gap is coming down right now with the money Everton's spending with their new ownership. Yep. Um, there is a, there is a, Manchester City has a traditional problem against Everton. It's it's kind of that second derby between Liverpool and Manchester, which are rival cities, right? Thirty miles apart. It's not Man, Man United and Liverpool, but it, it, there has been a derby feel, and there's also been a lot of just personal connections between the clubs from from guys like Howard Kendall on in, guys that have played for both clubs or managed both clubs. A lot of shared history. History. So, um, and I think shared experiences versus the, the big red clubs in their in their towns. So, uh, it always is a lively derby. Um, Ross Dyer hosting was was kind of cool on ESPN FC. Uh, uh, Dan Thomas was back on Tuesday, so they were back on their kind of normal schedule. But um, Dyer had um, again uh, McBride and Nickel with him, and uh, Gab Marcotti and, and uh, Ian Dark, as we mentioned, joined from London. Marcotti joined from London also, and. Um, it was a really good show. Um, Ian Dark, this this is interesting. So Ian Dark is able, Chris, we've seen now in the last year, year and a half, I would say actually started the year before the year, so maybe it's been two years now, has been able to come on the ESPN FC program as an analyst and do more than just give news, really kind of analyze what's going on uh, and, and give um, a perspective that he doesn't necessarily give when he when he's giving commentary. Mm-hmm. Now, when he's giving commentary, maybe he's pushing the co-commentator's buttons to say what exactly what he's saying on the show. But uh, it, it makes me think uh, Ian Dark at some point, if he doesn't want to uh, uh, be the lead commentator in the broadcast booth for matches up at the, in the gantry, could be a studio host at some point. More yeah. studio analyst. Yeah, a studio analyst, I can see, because he, he's definitely, uh, he's, get, he's not yet getting any, any younger. Um, right. but, but it is right. one of those things as far as uh, travel and uh, wear and tear on your body. I could see him being that type of um, analyst coming in from, from week to week. And and, uh, and and he's one of those types of guys, too, that I think a lot of soccer fans respect him for uh, just not just not only his personality but also his his knowledge i mean he's uh and and, and when you think about it Kartik, even during commentaries of matches in in for, for years he's always in a lull in the game he's always kind of talking about transfer stories or did you see this rumor or yeah. this or that so i think for espn fc as an analyst he, he's perfect for that well, why is it that we uh it, it, is it that we're holding arlo white to a different standard than ian dark ian dark does a lot of that on air also but maybe Maybe it's just the way they open matches is different uh, when I think about it. Because yeah. Ian Dark does do a lot of talking on the air as well. He, do, he, he is more conversational too, which is one of the reasons why I think he became such a, well, not only a cult figure in the United States, but uh, Go Go USA was kind of the, 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 kind of the tipping point of that. But, I mean, a lot of U.S. soccer fans, um, myself included, have a lot of time for him. He is more conversational. But his style, I think, is to me at least, is more conversational during lulls in the matches later on. So it's not going to be three, uh, two minutes of, you mean, talking nonstop and uh, you're missing the action and you haven't introduced the, co- the co-commentators yet. Uh, he is conversational, but in a different manner where you don't realize it as much and then you kind of get sucked into him and Maka having a really kind of uh, some banter or a, kind of a, a laugh or something something to kind of uh, brighten up the, the actual match if, if it is a little bit, uh, has a bit of a dip. Yeah, so uh, that was... That was good on Monday. Then Tuesday, this football just kept coming. Tuesday, uh, Nice uh, played host to uh, Napoli. I was really hoping, I'd love to have seen Nice in Champions League. They had such a strong season last year in Liga, but they uh, they got beat 2-0 and got beat 4-0 on aggregate. Uh, Mario Balotelli is a nightmare. Uh, got pulled off. I, I think uh, if anyone is willing to take him off of Nice's hands, <laughs> they'll they'll uh, offload him now. And uh, got, uh, the uh, Fox studio was very good for this game, and we're thinking, about the fact that we're not going to see these games next year on television, right? Uh, these third round playing games, if you will, playing um, ties from the Champions League. And then um, yesterday was uh, Liverpool and Hoffenheim. I'll, I'll be honest, I turned that game off when it was 3 0. Mm-hmm. Turns out Hoffenheim got clawed two back, but uh, didn't really make a difference. And so that, that, that was my week. A lot, lot of football, a lot of football on, and I'm sure I missed something uh, in there. 
Uh, it, it, I think there was another. Uh, oh yeah, Cel Celtic Astana. I watched a little bit of that match. That was on a uh, uh, was that Tuesday or Wednesday? Hmm. Uh, Tuesday. I think Tuesday, yeah, yeah, all runs together. Tuesday, yeah, that, that was together. before Nop Napoli, uh, Napoli, Nice, Nice, Napoli. But a uh, lot, a lot of football. Fox. Um, I mean, I, it's it's going to be interesting because I I'm guessing that the presentation from Turner is going to be better with Champions League, and we talked about this last week. But are we going to miss having access to all these games that we have on Fox? I'm guessing we, we do because ultimately yeah. we can complain about commentators. We can complain about presentation. We can complain about graphics and production levels, but uh, there's a difference between the match being on and not being on. Yeah. 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 And we'll, and we'll get to that in the listener mailbag. We've got a question about uh, the Turner and we'll give some, some, some of, of, of our thoughts at that point. So, Kartik, in terms of what I've watched uh, this past week, uh, I'm going to jump a little bit all over the place, but uh, Premier League pass, let's start off with that. So, this past weekend, uh, with Swansea playing in the early game on the Saturday, uh, I didn't uh, need to use Premier League pass for my Swansea game, but I, when I did get back to uh, my house after uh, going to the bar to, to watch the match, um, I did use, uh, actually, I used, uh, instead of using Premier League pass, because there weren't any games on at the 10 o'clock window, that I wanted to see exclusively. I wanted to kind of see all of the games. So I ended up uh, watching it on Goal Rush. Now, Goal Rush is not available on Premier League Pass, but it is available on NBC Sports app or NBCSports.com. And uh, being a cord cutter now, Kartik, so I was able to um, use my Fubo login and to log in to authenticate with the NBC Sports app and then watch Goal Rush through, through that. So even though I, I don't subscribe to... Comcast anymore and can still watch uh, Goal Rush. And, and I enjoyed that because not only do you get, um, at, as the goals go in or any incidents that happen throughout the grounds in, those, in that 10 o'clock to uh, noon window, immediately after the 19 minutes was up, you get um, a Goal Rush goes through and then shows the highlights for, for every single game from that 10 o'clock uh, to noon Eastern window. So if you did miss a little bit here or there, you get to see everything. So it's a really good roundup. Um, yeah, and, I th and I, I, here's the thing. Um, NBC, you know, it's these first two weeks, and I think they're going to they're gonna fall into a sweet spot. And they actually did go on on Monday after the Everton-Man City game went back through everything. And, and I, as I said, I watched Match of the Day, too, and they went through everything. But on the, on the bridge show, we're primarily Glide, yep. they are not showing every goal or every highlight anymore. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder if that's time I, I think constraints. it's time with too many goals, honestly. Yeah. I think that that's <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I I don't think it's a conscious thing that they've done. I don't think they've said, "Oh, we're we're going to we're going to uh, steer people towards watching uh, trying to find these goals on other mechanisms or, or watch match of the day tonight." I think there's just been too much when they've got um the 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 need to um send uh I I well, here's the thing. If, if you there will be times when they have um, 12, 30 games, which are not called called by Arlo White and either Lee Dixon or Graham Lusso. And when that happens, I think maybe they have enough time to show everything. What has what ended up happening this week and uh, what I think happened last week, last week, there were just too many goals this week. I think they had to have a um, stand up from uh, Dixon and White at Whiteheart, uh, sorry, at Wembley, mm -hmm. right, for five to seven minutes in yep. that half an hour block they have between the games. And also, they do a very good job of uh, um, if, if one game is running longer than, than the others at 10, 10 o'clock, switching to that game, game right? Mm -hmm. So um, that bleeds into their time. But they're not, I think the bottom line, what I'm trying to say is that they're not showing every highlight. You might be better off watching goal rush and just seeing everything without uh i don't know if they narrate all those highlights on goal rush but seeing that right right as soon as the games are over yeah right after it's over you get the the commentary from those specific matches so it'll switch from say um bournemouth against uh, west brom and whoever the commentator was for that one if it was gary taphouse for example then they'll switch to and it's usually about what two to three minutes each game and then it switches to the next next game whoever that game was with yeah. that with that native commentator that was doing that match so um 
and then Gold Rush itself, then you have the, the voiceover, so the person that's actually kind of uh, bringing you through the match. This one they had the main match on Gold Rush was Liverpool um, Palace and um, or Palace Liverpool and, and, and this this one what they did is kind of guided you through the whole match and then they switched over in, in case something did happen as far as Southampton scoring penalties or West Ham United coming back with Chicharito so it was actually pretty entertaining I, I enjoy it uh, and for me when I don't have any um, you mean when Swansea's my, my team's not playing to me it's a great way to watch and, and kind of catch up on everything that's going on now, now, Kartik, without mentioning the name of the pub, uh, so on that Saturday morning, I mentioned I did go to see Swansea Manchester United. The interesting thing for me was once um, the Swansea Man United game was over, there was probably about two people uh, uh, in the pub that grabbed their phones and grabbed their Chromecast and then started hooking up uh, on the TVs in the pub or uh, in this pub and then getting ready for the 10 o'clock kickoffs and, and getting the Premier League pass ready to show that. Because uh, what we found, Kartik, and, and what we know, is there's so many supporters groups around the United States, and in the last four years especially, they've really built up uh, those numbers so that if you were a fan of Everton or Crystal Palace or West Brom or Watford, you name it, uh, the supporters clubs around the United States that would go to their local pub and the, the patron, the owner of the pub, would then you mean, hook up uh, you know, direct TV and, and you could watch any of the games. Now that, that that's gone, with the, uh, with the Premier League Extra Time's gone and NBC Sports Live Extra is, is gone, uh, now people have to kind of figure out way, other ways. And it was just interesting seeing first person, seeing somebody grab a Chromecast and gra- grab a phone and with the permission of the bar owner, go ahead and, and get queue up one of the games ready for the uh, 10 o'clock kickoff. Yeah, uh, the pub you reference. Uh, has catered to supporters groups in the past. So um, I was wondering how they were coping this season. I was looking forward to checking it out. And uh, that's, I guess that's what's happening. Although technically that's not supposed to be allowed though. It's uh, the Premier League passes for residential. It's not for bar owners or pub owners to do. Uh, but NBC hasn't addressed this. So I've, I've asked them a couple of times to give me an update on, on what's happening. Is there a kind of a, a loophole or an opportunity for uh bar owners to have a separate service for them that they, that they can subscribe to uh, to show all these games. Um, so it's it's a kind of a black hole right now, and fans are taking advantage of the situation, as, as they should, uh, to make sure they don't miss any games if they do want to watch them in pubs. Uh, as far as some of the other ma- matches I watched, I watched, uh, like you said, Kartik, the Celtic Astana, I saw both of those legs, enjoyed that. Uh, saw the, the second leg of the Spanish Supercopa between Real Madrid and Barcelona, uh, watched the Bayern Leverkusen game, uh, Swansea Man United, etc. And then what else did I watch? Um, the um, Stoke Arsenal game. So that one with it being a cord cutter now to Kartik, my local NBC affiliate, uh, isn't available on Fubo or Sling or DirecTV now. So for that one, what I did was um, I went ahead and used Fubo TV uh, to watch the game on uh, Universo. And uh, Universo, they have. So I was watch, watched it in Spanish again, which is fine by me. Uh, in the afternoon, I watched some uh, La Liga in the opening weekend. So uh, 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 Garona. How, how was the presentation in, in on Universo? I'm curious. It um, it was um, interesting. I mean, the halftime was um, hosted by Sami uh, Sadovnik. Uh, who we met, I think, a couple of months ago, actually. Former Cold TV, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we met him. Um, so he was kind of just uh, in that studio set that we did see. So just a small studio, but uh, it was him, um, Manuel Sol, and I think there's one other person, kind of just just them, the three guys kind of standing up, facing the camera, and then just back and forth as far as some of their analysis. So uh, nothing spectacular, nothing bad, but just kind of straightforward. You I mean, having some experts talk about the game, uh, in Spanish, and um, the rest of it was was great. It was just 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 a normal game, just with a different uh, uh, language for the commentary. So uh, uh, Girona, uh, which is you know, Manchester City's uh, team that they bought in Spain, yeah, it's now their sister club, and they actually <laughs> played them in a friendly last week. That's right. Which that's I guess right. Giving us a heads up as so to what was happening. So, so I saw them uh, play Atleti. And Atleti, uh, I watched this game on BN Sports and Espanol uh, on Fubo TV. But Atleti was so lucky to even get a point in this game. Uh, Girona almost won the match. Uh, and then uh, Antoine Griezmann got sent off. But it was actually an entertaining game um, in a small stadium. 
Uh, then I watched uh, Sevilla against Espanyol. Again, this was on Bein Sports and Espanyol. And uh, on the English side, um, they were having Napoli against Verona. And uh, so they were showing Serie A, while the Spanish one was a network was showing the, the La Liga match. Um, and then for the Sevilla Espanol game, they were using the spider cam during the, during the game, so that was nice. Uh, I don't watch ex- the extra that often on BN Sports, but I did watch it on Saturday night, kind of just watching a lot of the La Liga games. You know, before you get into that, Chris, sure. I should say I always please make a reminder that I need to watch the extra more because it's a fantastic show with great talent and I never do it. So this is just a self reminder again. Yeah. It's a good reminder for me too, because it is one of those things that it's not on the top of my list, but when I do watch it, I do enjoy it. And on this Saturday, this past Saturday, they had um, the highlights of all the, the league on games and Kartik, I I was blown away by the, the, the the skill level in these uh, league on games and the goals. It was really entertaining. It was um, the highlights package. I think Bordeaux especially, I think they came back to tie a game, I think 3-3. I mean, just really entertaining football, really enjoyed it, especially kind of in the highlights package probably for Liga to me is probably more interesting because I don't have time to watch every single game. But anyway, they had the Liga games. They also had all the EPL games. Um, they showed all the highlights of that. And then you had an analysis from Gary Bailey, Thomas Rongin, and uh, Kate Murray in the studio. So I, I enjoyed it. It's been a while. I uh, watched the uh, Chelsea Spurs game. I watched that in the pub, too, so I didn't get a chance to really listen to the commentary that much. Uh, and then on the Sunday, I watched uh, Deportivo against the Real Madrid. Uh, Ray Hudson and Phil Shane on that one. I uh, watched the Man City game against Everton on, on the, uh, the Sunday. And then uh, caught up... Uh, actually, on the Monday, I'm sorry. And then caught up um, midweek with some of the uh, Champions League playoff games. And like you, watched Nice against Napoli... Uh, I also watched Liverpool against Hoffenheim, and what I did with that one was um, actually had it on mute. <laughs> so I, ha- I was watching the, the game, but uh, switched over. Actually, well, on a, uh, from the Swansea City app, they have the l- live audio from games. So they had the MK Dons against Swansea on the League Cup. So I was listening to Swansea playing the League Cup and then watching Liverpool against Hoffenheim at the same time. So it, actually, I'm... I'm, 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 I'm yeah, I'm used to that. I do that quite often where I'll watch something on mute and then listen to something else and be able to multitask and actually take both of those things in. But uh, that's it, Kartik, from uh, my past week of watching and following football. Yeah, uh, it's it's a little unfortunate, but I, and this will get to our feature topic of the week, but there isn't a single game in the US, US-based league that either of us watched this week. Yeah, there wasn't a lot on, though, because uh, Sunday... I MLS was, only had two games on this week. There was no yeah. ESPN game. There was a FS1, two FS1 games, no Univision game uh, that I recall. So and I think the, there were only two, two games. And then the previous Sunday, there was no games on. I think, the, well, there was one game on regionally, which is the DC United game, which is, had been postponed on the Saturday because of rain. Uh, but other th- And it had been rescheduled for the Sunday, but that was re- available regionally, I believe. But nationally, that's, uh, there was nothing on at all, which is kind of strange um, in terms of the calendar. You I mean, you're right in the middle of the season there, or towards the end of the season. So, Kartik, let's move on to TV streaming news. Yeah, a um, couple things. Uh, Univision Deportes has sub-licensed from BN Sports to radio rights for La Liga, Serie A, and Liga. Uh, the audio-only distribution will broadcast Univision Deportes Radio in 10 markets across the country uh, and the Euphoria uh, digital platform. So good news for those uh, fans of, of uh, those three leagues that are all uh, over the air on television on, on, uh, on DN. All right, Kartik, moving on. So uh, some good streaming numbers from the opening weekend of the Premier League uh, for NBC. Uh, the first weekend of action delivered uh, NBC Sports Digital's most streamed Premier League match uh, a week ever with 30, 38 million live minutes. Live minutes for the seven matches streamed by NBCSports.com and the NBC Sports app were up 24% compared to last season's opening weekend uh, with Friday's uh, Arsenal against Leicester game Uh, delivering 9.1 million live minutes to rank as the second most streamed ever match uh, behind Liverpool versus Manchester United on Monday from 2016. And and that had 10.3 million. Uh, In terms of the the measurement, uh, live minutes, I mean, again, it could be the same person that... um, is watching it and then comes back or it could be that uh, you mean you're just 
collecting kind of a, a mass of minutes. So someone might watch the game for 90 minutes. Someone might watch the game for 45 minutes or whatever it may be. But still, those are impressive numbers. Um, we don't, they, they, don't, they didn't share how many uniques, how many unique people actually watched those broadcasts. But whatever it is, it's working really well for uh, NBC on the, the streaming platform. And as we'll get to a little bit too on, on the TV numbers, it's doing well too. Yeah, so also this week we had uh, on Wednesday the announcement of Major League Soccer announcing the 2017 Audi Cup, uh, Audi MLS Cup playoff schedule. And uh, this was very controversial. And, and I have to give props to MLS. I think they understand now uh, some of what we talk about on this show regularly, even though they won't publicly acknowledge it, that um, they're having a hard time driving audiences to watch matches on television uh, and, and get up te television ratings on weekends during football season, during American football season. And uh, this is, again, why I, I think what I, I hear from so often from MLS defenders, oh, well, you, you want to change the calendar and we'd be competing with football more. But you'd be competing with football more if you flip the calendar in the first half of the season, which you know, especially in MLS because you have playoffs, doesn't matter that much. Um, but what MLS has done with this playoff schedule this year has gone heavy on weekday games so what you're going to have um to start the um the playoffs are kind of the play-in games that the five the, the three versus six and four versus five in both conferences two games of, on october 25th and 26th two midweek games and then the eastern conference uh semi-final season uh, uh, series. Both of the first legs will be uh, Mondays and uh, Monday and a Tuesday. Uh, national uh, broadcast FS1 on Monday, ESPN2 on uh, ESPN on Tuesday. Western Conference Sunday, Tuesday, um, and then um, the second legs will be on Sunday on a Sunday because they can't. Uh, they have an international break. They have to observe, so uh, they can't. They can't push that to a Monday. So Sunday will be the second leg. Um, then you'll have an international break. And uh, MLS will come back from the international break 16 days later, not 14 days later, 16 days later, again, because they're being smart and they don't want to compete on the weekends with a uh, combination of American football, Premier League, La Liga, et cetera, uh, uh, Tuesday uh, uh, games and then uh, Thursday games. And then MLS Cup will be a uh, Saturday at 4 p.m., which I believe will put it head to head with the SEC championship game on CBS. Uh, hmm. uh, this game will be on ESPN. Uh, but uh, again, SEC championship game is not maybe quite as uh, difficult as going up against an NFL game. I don't know. I, I don't follow American football ratings. I live in Florida, so I tend to think the SEC is bigger than the NFL, but I know it's not <laughs> nationally. I tend to think college football is bigger than the NFL, but I know it's not. Uh, but that's that's who they'll be competing against. So um, I think savvy game plan from MLS here, uh, uh, moving to weekdays primarily with their broadcasts, uh, and then because they're observing the international break as they always do in, in, in postseason, uh, they're going to essentially have a two and a half week break instead of a two week break between games. Yeah, I agree. It's a smart move in terms of um, trying to move these games to be very TV friendly in terms of uh, some big TV numbers. D does it say, Kartik, on there what the kickoff times are? I mean, just roughly. I mean, are they 7, 7 p.m. Eastern? Are they 10 p.m. Eastern? Some games there are. Um, Western Conference semifinal, uh, they have... Uh, well, no, actually, it's just uh, Eastern Conference Championship uh, f leg one uh, t Tuesday, November 21st will kick off at 8 p.m. on ESPN. They have that. Uh, other than that, I don't have any times. OK. Times TVD on everything else. OK. So so that oh, and of course, MLS Cup, I mentioned, is 4 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. So yeah. so so the weeknights uh, could be great uh, as long as we're not going to get a lot of 10 o'clock uh, Eastern kickoffs. I mean, if they can get it into the seven to eight. Uh, Eastern time for kickoff games, uh, other than the West Coast games, of course. But uh, that, yeah, that, that, that's definitely. Look, look, this is, this is a, an acknowledgement by MLS because I've I've been very critical through the years of MLS fans who who, who act as if and the league itself who act as if attendance is the sole metric for determining success or, or, or failures of leagues. And and uh, MLS in doing this is sacrificing some of their attendance because they're going to be weeknight games. Uh, and keep in mind, playoff games are games that are often not part of season ticket packages or other flex packs you have to you have to resell and repurchase those tickets if you, you have to resell them if you're the club repurchase them if you're the fans they're sacrificing i think a bit of attendance to try and get the tv numbers up and that's uh that's what i want to see i want to see the effort so uh mm -hmm. i say 
uh, hats off to them, props to them. They have a lot of other issues that they need to solve to get those TV numbers up. But this is, uh, at least from where I sit, an acknowledgement that the that the uh, arguments we've made about timings and about attendance versus TV numbers. And MLS fans who are very uh, defensive of the league will always push back on me and say, well, look, our attendance is higher than Serie A. It's higher than Liga. Uh, who cares about the television numbers? No one watches TV anyway now. Everyone's cord cutting, etc. I think this is an acknowledgement from MLS HQ. They get our critiques and they're taking some steps to try and address it. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, it's a good move. Uh, all right, let's move on to TV ratings and uh, some big numbers uh, across the board uh, this past week. Uh, the biggest one was 1 million for Chivas against Puebla on Univision and Univision Deportes Network combined. That was on Saturday. That was the uh, 10 p.m. Eastern to midnight match. Uh, in terms of the Premier League, some, some more big numbers. You had uh, 825,000 people that watched uh, Stoke against Arsenal. That was on NBC, over the air, and you know, um, Universo combined. Uh, for the Spurs-Chelsea game, you had uh, 814,000 people. That was in, in uh, NBCSN and Telemundo combined. Um, for the Liverpool-Crystal Palace game, 541,000. Uh, Swansea Man United, a very early uh, game that was 439,000. And even the Huddersfield against Newcastle on a Sunday morning. Uh, Huddersfield with not a big footprint in the United States by any means. Newcastle that, that has a strong base, but still, I mean, it's still a smaller club in terms of uh, TV ratings. That one had uh, 289,000 people watching that game. So pretty decent numbers there. Kartik, what about some of the um, MLS and uh, Bundesliga numbers? Yeah, so the the MLS, the highest profile game that was on this uh, weekend was the Portland, New York Red Bulls game on FS1 and was also on Fox Deportes. Combined, it only had 138,000 viewers. Uh, that's not very good. There was a late Sunday night game, Seattle against Minnesota, uh, decided by a controversial call call in stoppage time, uh, 182,000 viewers on FS1. Again, games with Seattle tend to get better numbers. Those aren't particularly good numbers, but uh, better numbers, uh, Seattle, Minnesota. 127,000 for Bayer Leverkusen and Bayern. Bayern and Bayer Leverkusen on FS1 and Fox Deportes. A pretty good number for a Friday afternoon, yeah. um, all things considered. Uh, but th that Bundesliga bump didn't necessarily last through the weekend. We had 109,000 on NWSL for uh, the Spirit and uh, the current Courage. And that's a number that's uh, kind of becoming uh, commonplace. I think what we've seen through the season, this lifetime is developing a core audience uh, and they're not dipping below a certain number. So uh, that's a very good sign in the first year of that package. And, and the league is going to expand. And I think uh, things are on a kind of an uptick for NWSL. Uh, really quickly going through the rest, 100,000 for Wolfsburg Dortmund, FS1 and, uh, and uh, Fox Deportes. Deportes, uh, Gladbach, uh, Univision Deportes, excuse me, Gladbach, Cologne, FS1, and uh, Fox Deportes, 77,000. Schalke, Leipzig, a game I watched, 66,000 uh, between English and Spanish. Freiburg and Frankfurt, which was uh, the next day, 48,000. And then 7,000 for the New York Cosmos and Indy 11 on BN Sports and NASL. Uh, Chris, I mean, and I'm an NASL guy. I worked for the league for three and a half years. There is zero interest in that league this season. And uh, I think part of it is the Cosmos not being as strong as they've been. And then I just think there's a there's no context around the league. It's just this kind of independent league with um, eight teams. They'll have 12 teams next year, but floating out in its own ether. And uh, unless you're a hardcore fan of those teams, you're not going to watch. So um, I'm not quite sure. I mean, maybe it's better for being um, than having uh, repeats of La Liga and Serie A games. I'm not sure about that. I think you could put on a repeat of a random La Liga game and probably get more viewers, honestly. For sure, for sure. I, I guess for the NASL, it'll help uh, when those games are going to be on be in Sports and Espanol. Those that's going to help. Those numbers that, will that's go up. Starting, that's starting in two weeks. Yeah, yeah, so that's coming up soon. All right, listener mailbag. So the first couple of uh, responses we got from listeners was were, uh, was in regards to Turner Sports and the Champions League uh, episode that we did. First one is from uh, Justo Hernandez Montoya. Uh, he sent this in through Facebook. He says, it feels like pay-per-view for uh, Champions League before 1994 or Premier League late 1990s, early 2000s, limiting the number of live games on open TV is backwards. Hope I, I hope that Univision doesn't jump into this in the same uh, uh, instance. Uh, knockout games should all be available. People don't want to pay for another streaming service. We should see and wait how NBC Sports does this with uh, their concept for the Premier League. Moving on to the next one, 
This is from Paul. Um, he sent it in through email. And I won't read the whole thing, but he says, why is everybody going to streaming? Why buy the rights and not show it on TV? I just don't get it. NBC showed one live game and four streamed games uh, uh, last week. Canada even showed three live games. NP NBC went from showing five live games to one game. Now Turner are going to go streaming. I've heard nightmares where TVs are on the wall and people can't connect the HDMI stick even if they wanted to which I've gone through that before too. Uh, but uh, it says streaming is never going to be as good as cable satellites. Why not put these games on TV subs subscriptions, charge higher than stream uh, streaming on, on a buffering crappy service? So a uh, couple of good comments from listeners. And, yeah. and um, actually, I'll read one more too, Kartik. There was, this one was posted on uh, worldsoccertalk.com, I think yesterday, from David Crowley. It says, will I be able to watch the championship on BN Sports like I did last season? I have no computer service where I live, so online options do not uh, work for me. And in all these cases, Kartik, there are similar threads because whether it's the championship or whether it's the Champions League, we have to remember that not everybody has, uh, well, not everyone has a computer. Not everyone has a really good internet connection, and not everyone, uh, ev everyone's not able, able to to actually stream these matches. Yes, yes, more and more people are streaming services are getting better as as are internet speeds. But you're leaving out a lot of people that just prefer to watch games on television. And uh, with Premier League Pass with uh, Turner Sports and their streaming product for uh, all of the Europa League, except for the final, and about 50% of the Champions League, uh, as well as the championship with uh, on ESPN3, you're, you're losing a lot of people that uh, normally would be watching these matches. So, Kartik, let's move on to the next... Uh, I think with League Cup also... Go ahead. Uh, BN's historically showed uh, second round League Cup games. I, I, look, I think the point Paul made was especially good. I, I wonder if at some point we're going to hit a happy medium where uh, the the TV, uh, the rights holders, uh, as he suggests, charge uh, higher than streaming uh, to put a game on a TV subscription. If that we're going to get at some point um, because of, of – just the way the uh, the consumers uh, react to this, and I think uh, I think that might be the happy medium. I think that that's a that's a really good suggestion from Paul. Yeah, I think the most important thing is making sure that you don't leave people behind. Um, so if they do want to watch on television, and we all know that everything's moving towards streaming, but if you do want to watch on television, there should be that option. Um, so yeah, it's definitely some some some. Uh, some I'll great feedback. admit to you right here and. Uh, right now, and who knows what I'll do in the next few weeks with NBC uh, Sports Gold because I still haven't bought it. If I were able to use the spillover channels um, on Direct TV 491, 492, the ones that they used to show um, extra time on, uh, I I would have bought it the first day. Yeah. But I don't like the idea of having to watch those games on my computer while I'm watching because it's always going on simultaneously with a game that's on uh, on NBCSN or CNBC right. or wherever. I, I don't like that idea. If I were able to just channel surf from NBCSN to another television channel, I would have bought it. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I don't think I'm alone in that. No, no, no. I've heard a lot of people say that too. And and, it's, and again, it's not about the price. It's more about the accessibility. And I think a lot yeah, of people would have would have paid paid paid, paid more. Say, so tell me how much it is. You know, is it a hundred bucks, two hundred bucks, whatever it is for the season? Uh, you mean include all the games? What, what, you mean just just give it, give me an option to to pay to have that service on television, versus forcing me through a online version that is only going to have certain games and uh, has has some growing pains. It definitely Premier League Pass still has a long way to go, but. So if you do have any feedback or questions or uh, comments for us, send those in through us uh, uh, to us through email, uh, and that's web at worldsoccertalk.com, uh, through Twitter at WSoccerTalk, or through Facebook at facebook.com slash worldsoccertalk. Now, Karthik, let's move on to our feature topic of the week, and this one is an interesting one. I did some research. So this weekend... And this weekend is uh, roughly a, an average weekend. It's some, some weekends have more games, some ge weekends have less games. But this particular weekend, there are 166 soccer games available to fans who want to watch the beautiful game on TV or online in the United States. That is incredible in terms of that number. Now, for this weekend, there are 11 MLS games being played. Out of those 11 games, only four of them are scheduled for national broadcasts. 
And those four games happen to be on one of the biggest weekends on the MLS calendar with uh, several derbies taking place. So out of the 166 soccer games available in the, in the U.S. this weekend via TV or online, only 2.4% of the games are nationally televised MLS matches. Or another way to look at it is that sports fans in the U.S. can choose between 11 MLS games, four of which are only available uh, nationally, uh, the other seven through regional broadcast or MLS Live. So they can choose between 11 MLS games or 155 games from other leagues from around the world. But in reality, if you don't count those MLS games, I mean, so it, it, it's uh, the games are on MLS Live. It's just, just, just four games available. And in a, in a scenario like this, Kartik, uh, it seems to be that MLS is drowning in a sea filled with so many choices of soccer uh, for sports fans from around the world. And, and, and those are just the numbers, just the, the legal numbers. Now, illegal, you mean, those numbers will uh, grow even more in terms of uh, how many more matches are available illegally. Now, Kartik, I'll just add one more thing before I get some of your comments on this one, too. This is a quote, uh, and I'll see if you can figure out who this quote is from. And this is a quote from about four to five years ago. This more soccer on U.S. television than any other sport by far. You've got European soccer. You've got Mexican soccer. You've got Major League Soccer. There's way too much soccer on television. I think all of us ha have to uh, figure out a way to narrow that window so you can get a situation like the NFL has a couple of days a week, short schedule, something that's very compelling and very targeted. Any thoughts on who, who said that? That must have been Commissioner Garber. Correct, correct. So, Kartik, what, what, what do you think? I mean, it's 166 games this weekend. Four of them are going to be nationally televised. Um, soccer fans... I mean, in the U.S., have more choices than ever before in terms of uh, watching leagues from around the world. How can MLS compete? Well, they're trying to compete this weekend with Heineken Rivalry Week and with uh, ads all over television. You're a cord cutter now, but if you watch a uh, random cable program, CNN, news on CNN, uh, a, a, a show on A&E, you're going to see a commercial for Heineken Rivalry Week. They're going all out. Uh, the highlight of this, of course, is the Cascadia. Well, the highlight from my perspective is Cascadia, Portland, Seattle, uh, not the, um, the New York Derby, although I think that's where they're trying to push people, right? That's Friday mm -hmm. night. Um, but uh, they're trying to compete this weekend. But realistically, is Cascadia going to get the same number as um, uh, there's a big Premier League game this weekend, right? Everton's Liverpool playing. Uh, uh, who is it? Liverpool. Ar oh, yeah. Are they going to get the same number as Liverpool Arsenal? No, they're not. Um, it's very unlikely they do. So that's um, – that's something they have to deal with. Now, this quote from a couple of years ago where Garber talked about shortening the season, that can never happen because American players are already um, – and American fans hate when I say this because Alexi Lawless jumped up and down when, uh, when Jurgen Klinsmann said American players weren't fit enough, weren't uh, uh, to play uh, – at a high level in his estimation from a um, uh, for the U.S. national team. Now, I think Klinsman was using it as an excuse because, again, he tactically he was a mess. But I don't think you, American players, players that come from Major League Soccer, are fit enough to go compete around the calendar in Premier League, La Liga, Serie A, Bundesliga, Liga, uh, and those five leagues at least. I don't think they're fit enough, American players. You have to get your, your, your level up to a certain point if you're going to shorten the season and make it a boutique season like the, the league is in india the league in india is about 90 days the uh the league which has attracted all kinds of stars uh, uh from from europe and now you have even coaches like steve koppel guys that are where Mat Mat uh, materazzi was coaching the chennai team and etc a bunch of guys who've gone there they competed uh, with MLS for players, then you're not doing anything to help or maintain the fitness levels of your players, of your younger players. And there's a downside, which is the competitiveness of the United States on, on the international stage. Even if you make the season shorter, more meaningful, more relevant, you make. So if you make the season shorter, every game is much more relevant, right? Um, maybe they have to do what the NASL has done. They have to have a spring and a fall or a, mm -hmm. a winter and a summer. Right? And, and, award a championship based on that but again that goes away from the traditional thinking american sports uh, thinking that uh, the, the league has um they have an opportunity to make these changes when the next television contract is negotiated they're going to have to make some changes they can't continue uh, on this road i like what i've seen from this playoff uh, format as we talked about earlier in the show 
I think even now in the middle of this television contract, they may have to make a serious adjustment and move their national nationally televised games off of Sunday nights and off of Friday nights and on to Wednesday and Thursday. Yes, that's going to hurt attendance. And MLS has made such a big deal through the years about our attendance being higher than Serie A, being higher than Liga, or maybe they're not higher than Serie A, but they're higher than Serie A if you take Juventus and the two Milan teams out. I think that's the caveat. Mm -hmm. But basically, they've made a big deal for years about that. Oh, our league is actually more popular. We have more, we have higher attendance than the NBA or NHL. No, you're not, because uh, you go to Los Angeles, there are more people wearing Chelsea shirts than wearing uh, LA Galaxy shirts. You go to New York, there are more people wearing Real Madrid shirts and wearing uh, New York Red Bull shirts, on and on and on. Your league is not very popular, and those attendance numbers are essentially lies. You know, you're essentially lying to yourself and right, deluding just, yourself take, and your fan base. Yeah, it's take, so my take point is, I, yeah, my point is, I would start moving games next season. Um, to midweek, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, those three nights in particular, and give ESPN a package, maybe of their thirty eight games, 36 games they show a year, 20 of them be midweek. And then um, FS1, uh, I don't know what their bandwidth is midweek, but over the summer, they all have they all have bandwidth. So do do that. I, I think that's the solution. And I I think they're they're kind of going that direction, uh, Chris. I, I'm all often saying that MLS isn't responsive and they're living in a vacuum and, and living in their own world and in denial. But I think this playoff schedule triggers the conversation. I, I hope that those get decent enough ratings that next season they're thinking Tuesday night is a good night. Because I think Tuesday night is a night I'd watch MLS every week. Whereas when they're on on Sunday, I'm burnt down from yeah. Premier League, Bundesliga, La Liga, Serie A. Uh, and it's difficult, quite I, frankly. Yeah, I think MLS is in a very difficult situation or a position because even a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night or a Thursday night, um, then if you've got Champions League on during the daytime, someone tapes that game, comes home, watches, I mean, Liverpool against, I don't know, AC Milan, whoever it is, there's, there's going to be always kind of those midweek games that could take priority. Right, and now Champions League is on Turner, which they have no interest in promoting MLS. And when, when it was a Fox uh, property, Good point. it might have been a little easier to do this. Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, I mean, to me, for, for me, Kartik, if, I mean, say if you take the Premier League, I mean, you've got those games on for the US market, you've got them on at 7.30 in the morning, 4.30 uh, Pacific time, you could put those Premier League games, the Premier League could change their schedule, and people would change their behaviors to fit those schedules just to watch those matches because they're, they're so hooked. Um, with MLS... You don't have that same type, type of passion. Yes, among the fans that support their teams on a local basis, yes. On the television side, you don't have that same type of attachment or, or, or kind of a passion. So I think MLS is going to f have a tough time no matter what day of the week they put those games on because, uh, you mean, is the quality good enough to pull people in, to, to change the schedule, to, to make that a priority? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. But I just feel sorry for MLS because in terms of the competition, you look at this weekend, Friday, there's 37 soccer games on, Saturday, 67, and Sunday, 62. Now, the midweek games, there's fewer games on, so there's less competition. So maybe the midweek way for the playoffs uh, is a good solution, which I think it is. We'll have to wait and see what those numbers are. But I just did the research this this week, Kartik, for the podcast today, and just wanted to kind of just share, share some of those eye-opening numbers in terms of the competition that MLS faces. They would argue it's quality over quantity. And, and yes, this quantity of games, many of them, well, not many, some of them are college games, some of them are very kind of niche leagues that you may watch and find the, the, the level of competition not that good. Uh, but the reality is that there are a lot of competitive games on this weekend, uh, not 166, but there's going to be a lot, a lot of games there that MLS has, has to uh, compete with. And as world soccer becomes more popular and as streaming become, becomes more accessible and as more TV networks start to pick up more and more leagues and, and friendlies and competitions, which they are, uh, it's going to become more fractured and more difficult for MLS to actually com compete. So, um, yeah, it's t tough times ahead for MLS. All right, Kartik, so, so where can listeners find you on the Internet if they want to uh, send you a tweet or send you a message or, or follow uh, some of your work? 
Yeah, you can find me at Twitter at KKFLA737. You can friend me on Facebook or Google Plus uh, with my name, Carter Krishnire. Um, uh, check us out at World Soccer Talk. Uh, other other places I write include the Florida Squeeze, uh, FloridaSqueeze.com, Post America, and uh, other places around the web. All right. Well, thanks for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, Audio Boom, and WorldSoccerTalk.com. If you like the show, share it with your friends on social media and give us a review. And Kartik, what should they do? Enjoy your football.